great. So welcome, welcome back, and welcome to uh, to Jason and Sagi. I'm hoping that uh, that he will uh, turn on his camera. Good morning. Fantastic. So thank you for joining us, uh, Sagi and uh, Jason. So so what we're gonna we, let's just uh, let's let's dive in. So um, this session, cloud security and the modernization journey. Um, we've got quite a nice uh, set of set of questions to, to pick up this morning. Um, so just to, just by means of an introduction. So Jason Malako is the director of architecture and strategic solutions, um, based in North America. Um, very much involved in many of the North American. Um, you know, sales activities and um, very you know technical uh, architectural um, input into those activities. And Sagi Chaim, who um, originally uh, from Israel, is uh, also located in, in North America and on the West Coast. is a solution architect, and um, you know, we're really really looking forward to this discussion. So um, let, let's get started. Maybe uh, Jason, um, if I may, start with you. Uh, the, the, First kind of question, and we can you know continue with the discussion. What, in what your mind? What are the key cybersecurity challenges um, that are encountered during you know a cloud migration um, process? Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Howard. Yeah. So again, just setting the context that that you know we're talking about cybersecurity. There's a lot of challenges that go into migrating you know from on premises or from one cloud to another, and all these sorts of cloud migration activities that take place, but clearly we're here talking about cybersecurity specifically. And, uh, you know, there are, you know, a number of key challenges. And one of those key challenges, as an example, uh, we'll talk about several of them, you know, both Sagi and I will, but uh, one of the key challenges, of course, is compliance risks. You know, and as you think about uh, compliance that has all kinds of different, you know, brings all sorts of different thoughts to people and, and, and whatnot. It could be, you know, you, you said I'm from, you know, North America, but, you know, even in North America here, we think a lot about GDPR, you know, the, the uh, general data protection regulation, which uh, has a lot to do with uh, data sovereignty policies and where your data is stored. And this concept of migrating to the cloud, you start to ask, you know, where exactly is your data? So these data Data residency requirements uh, for compliance, like I said, GDPR is is uh, is very important. Something uh, you know, many you know, everyone's thinking about because you know it's a pretty much a a fact that you have you know European citizens all over uh, and uh, where that that applies. You know, and it's it's not just uh, maybe GDPR. Some another example might be some another compliance example might be something like the payment card industry data security standard that uh, you know kind of regulates the credit card industry and and how that's secured. They actually have, you know, a whole specific special interest group around cloud security, uh, computing guidelines, and this sort of thing. So the, the the point that I'm really trying to make is you move to the cloud. There's all these new attack vectors which bring new requirements. And interestingly, there you know there's an internationally recognized cloud framework uh, from uh, that to help you manage your risk uh, from an organization called the Cloud Security Alliance. They they produce something called uh, the Cloud Controls Matrix, which was really designed to deal with a, a number of these compliance frameworks. You know, some of them, you know, this uh, cornucopia of buzzwords, if you will, things like uh, you know ISO twenty seven thousand and one, uh, you know HIPAA. Uh, the NIST CSF, PCI DSS again, you know, these, these are just some examples, right? So HIPAA being a health related law, um, for instance, a healthcare related law uh, requires, you know, at least annual risk assessments. And those often occur more frequently, but this really makes it difficult to show compliance because of the rape, you know, the rapid nature of public clouds, you know, these services are constantly changing and yet you have to come back and, and show compliance with these. So, you know, there's a lot of requirements around that. And so really uh, that is one of the key challenges. And, and another key challenge, you know, Saeed, what do you think about, you know, data exposure and access controls in, as a key challenge? Yeah. as it relates to migration of cloud to cloud yeah you're right and and you know i think that one of the things that uh guide a lot of uh the companies when they go to the cloud is those compliance so you know they 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 had it in the on-prem and now they move to the cloud so one of the things that uh how can they you know uh apply those same principles and the same controls on the cloud and and the problem most of the time is you know is, is when we're talking about uh the data and where the data sits and and now we're migrating our data to the cloud. So a lot of the time, 
lot of companies are, uh, you know, suffering from that exposure, right? And, and the problem is that uh, it's very, very hard to manage the access because right now, as you know, the cloud gave us the ability to work from everywhere, to access the data from anywhere. And this, from one side, brought a lot of, uh, lot of benefits, uh, especially in the COVID era. But on the other side, uh, you know, it's a lot of uh, challenges for the organization, especially for the security and the IT teams of how they can enable this uh, access from anywhere in, in a safe manner. Right. And I think that uh, uh, we talked a lot about, uh, you know, in, in the past about skill shortage, right? Yeah, absolutely. So just asking you about data exposure, you know, one, one just question about that, you know, and access controls. Do, do, you, do you think there are specific challenges there that, that are key? Is it is it around identity? Is it, you know, you'll often hear things like, I don't know, not to pick on any particular cloud, cloud provider, but, you know, it's been often talked about AWS S3 buckets, you know, they're not by default read only anymore, but uh, you know, what are some of those key challenges in, in the uh, access control and exposure as you migrate? Yeah, so I think that, uh, you know, when, when, we look on, uh, when we look on the cloud, so what happens is that if it's, there is no, there are not a lot of room for mistakes, right? When we was on the on-prem, if we made a mistake, it's okay because we are staying in a controlled environment. It means that we are inside our uh, organization and, Often the blast radius was short, uh, was uh, smaller, but when we go to the cloud now, the access is from everywhere. So to define the right least privileged access model to the not only to my employees but also the third party uh, vendors that working with me, my customers, right? So now I want to expose my services to my customer. This is usually why we are in the business. So understanding those controls and the ability that we have in the cloud really challenging especially for you know uh, and 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 we talk about in the past about this the skill shortage so because we are throwing our employees on the cloud and now they need to migrate all the knowledge and all the expertise from the traditional on prem to the cloud where everything like put in the, in the ball and got mixed because right now in the past, you can talk about, uh, if we talk about uh, uh, VM, so you, you have a team that's going on and provisioning VMs. And for the networking, there is a team that's going and provisioning the networking. And in the cloud, you need to do everything. So when you set up a VM, you also talk about networking. When you set up the networking, you also talk about control. When you talk about the control, it's identity and access. And this became so challenging for the teams in the beginning and, and that's why we see, as you said, for example, no one knew that when you create an S3 bucket, for example, it's open to the internet. Right? So a lot of that exposure came from the S3 bucket. Um, a lot of people doesn't really understand the roles that they provide to users. So sometimes, you know, when the user got exposed, the amount of permission that he had was so high that it was really easy to do lateral movement and then expose data. And those are the challenges. Yeah, you know, something else came to mind real quick, but, uh, you know, moving on to the, the next one, just access control. You know, you and I probably just take for, for granted things like, you know, the shared responsibility model, right? Everybody who's in cloud thinks about the shared response has probably been introduced to that, but maybe some of our audience haven't. And, you know, just things like physical access uh, to equipment is the responsibility of the cloud provider and all the nuance. You know, we, we could talk forever about that, but the, the, the point is uh, that these things have to be considered, right? Uh, access control is not just you know, cyber, but it's it's also physical. But yeah, kind of moving on to an, another another item that we think is really key to to consider is just you know misconfigurations and how, and has that relates to you know skill shortages. You know, ultimately things like you know Sagi was talking about earlier, like identity access management policies. You know, these are just highly highly nuanced uh, within public cloud, and, and it's easy to to mess up. You know, role based you know role based access controls. You know privilege creep, you know, all this sorts of things that starts to happen. How do those map, you know, things, uh, you know, just the built-in roles, like in something like Azure, I can't even remember the number off the top of my head. Maybe you recall it's like 120 built-in roles or something like that. Not, not even counting all the specific roles that people make. So the ability to miscon 
misconfigure things like user accounts or services accounts to which role and how much privilege it has. You know, can get very, very granular into even into databases at the column level, you know, very, 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 very nuanced, right? I mean, all the different things could be anything like network security groups being failed to be configured, firewall rules, and how networking works, right? You know, whether that's a VNet or a VPC, you know, having, you know, blocking unauthorized access, keeping that, again, that least privilege model, not just from an identity, but from a network access to do that. You know, as I think about it, is not just easy to to solve. You know, if you think of numerous numerous sources, I, I think of uh, what Gartner put it out, ISC squared, uh, who else? Uh, Deloitte, Gartner, a number of them are all talking about the the skills shortage, and that skills shortage is really a, a, a double whammy. It's it's not just you know in our own practices of hiring people, which we're doing frequently, uh, not just cloud security, or excuse me, not just security, it's cloud. So finding security resources is difficult. Then you need cloud security resources. And then you often have, you know, a hybrid or poly cloud environment. You're, you're really looking at, you know, difficult to find uh, uh, for sure. And, you know, there's a lot of technology out there. And, and if you've not heard of something like cloud security posture management or uh, CSPM, you know, these technologies certainly can help with these sorts of things. But, you know, there just is no substitute for training the people who are involved in, in, in the cloud transition environment, right? In, in transitioning from, you know, other clouds or uh, from on-premises and this sort of thing. So just really that is one of the key things, misconfigurations and skill shortages, uh, you know, uh, through the whole, you know, throughout the whole stack. Just to add something, because Jason said something very important and, you know, it's uh, about, so one of, one of the challenges that we have because of the skill shortage and because of, uh, the variety of services that we have in the cloud. So a lot of the time, there are multiple services that bring us the same things, but the amount of control is different, right? And you talk about uh, the shared models. So we have things like SaaS, which is a uh, you know software and service, and we have PaaS, which is platform and service. And a very good example, and I believe that anyone that are working security on 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 Azure, for example, know it. It's about the difference between log analytics and Azure Data Explorer, right? So basically behind the scene in terms of the engine they are, they are the same they're both working on cost two but for example as if i want to provide as you said an access in in the row level right i cannot do it in log analytics but i can do it in azure data explorer right so even though both of them provide me the same capabilities they provide me a different set of controls and this control again going back to the misconfiguration so the higher control that I have, the more effort that I need to maintain this kind of service. And those are the challenges. And that's where we need to understand, you know, if I want to put more effort and I need more skills, skills or I need to, I want less control and less skill, but then, you know, I cannot uh, get everything. And this is like the challenge that uh, going to the cloud. For sure. So another another challenge that that we think is 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 key is really the difficulty in in monitoring and detecting threats, in the in, in specifically in the cloud. And what what are some of the challenges you you see you're seeing specifically related to that, Saeed? Yeah. So I think that you know when we're talking about uh, monitoring and, and things like that. So I think that this is a uh, um, this is one of the key things that we want to do when we start because we want visibility. Right? We want to understand what's going on and we want to, to understand when those challenges happen or those, you know, that exposure, the, the uh, access control, uh, the misconfiguration. We want to be aware when those kind of things happen. Uh, hopefully we want also to, uh, uh, we don't want them to happen, right? We want to stop them before they happen, but we probably, no one, in the world is able to protect against 100% of the risk, right? So when those things happen and they will happen, <laughs> then we want to be uh, aware that, uh, we want to be sure that we can at least detect and respond, right? And the challenges that we see a lot is, is between, again, it's always the, the questions of, of what I'm willing to let go, right? Because the more that I want to monitor, the more that I will pay. Right, but uh, on the other side, we are in the era of data, so we want to monitor and detect everything. And and, and I think that one of the key things that people offer overlook, as you said, is is monitoring. 
So they, they rush out, they set up a platform, they set up uh, services, uh, they set up the networking, they get people working on it, but, and only then they're talking about, hey, maybe we need to monitor these kind of things. So how am I going to monitor it? I'm going to bring it to my own prem, I'm going to take it to the cloud, I'm going to use uh, you know, those kind of challenges that are uh, a lot. Yeah, you, you kind of bring up a couple points or thoughts from, from myself. It was, it was just one, I, I so appreciated how, in, in my words, you said there's no silver bullet, right? And I think what some people can do is say, hey, if there's no silver bullet, why, why, why try or why not? But it's also important to remember that, you know, you can't, you can't detect everything. However, the the malicious actors, right? They're they're using tactics, techniques, and procedures. That you, if you were on our earlier SOC masterclass, uh, you know the CISO was talking about, you know, a cyber kill chain. There's all kinds of different threat models. The point is, we have a number of opportunities in, in which we can detect, uh, you, you know, malicious actors. So we we might not be able to detect everything they do, but at the end, you, you know, we we can find them with different different detection methods. So all all is not not lost there is is uh, what I guess was key to me, just the, the idea that, you know, different, a, a variety of different detection methods where, um, like I said, cyber kill chain is just one one example that folks could read on. We probably can't spend a bunch of time talking about that. But the other um, that I'm thinking about specifically to cloud, cloud migrations is, you know, I'm obviously, you know, old enough to not have been born a digital from the digital generation. And so I often think on premise and what people often do is they try to take their on premises architectures and in security, it's often based on packet capture, right? They wanna just throw on some sort of network tap or you know, a span port or whatever you wanna to use to move the capture, you know, capture packets right off of the wire and bring it to an analytics platform. But doing that in the cloud is uh, let's just say, not not done the same way. So it forces different strategies to, to think through how you're gonna approach things. So I guess my, what I would add is just the difficulty in monitoring and um, detecting threats is related to the fact that, look, it, when you're migrating the cloud, you can't do it like you did it on-premise because it is different and you need to use cloud native approaches. So you can't just take those, those uh, same tools, lift and shift them because then it's ultimately not. Yeah. Cloud data, it's, right? it's a lot of companies that are doing lift and shift, and yeah. then they say, "Hey, we did it wrong," and then so, there are two options: they're or they're going back to the on-prem, or they're starting, you know, to to uh, real everything. Yeah, I don't want to get get too off topic, and, and, and I'll move on. But I'll, I'll I'll make a comment. You you get the final word on this. But uh, r related to that, difficult to monitor, detect, and threats. You know, lift and shift is what's often done, and because that's not cost effective, and they run over budgets on the. You know the infrastructure and IT side that often leads to challenges on 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 the cybersecurity side because because lift and shift is really not cost effective so it, it pushes the the cyber budgets but yeah you know we probably in the interest of time um, should move on to you know those were the key challenges you know we can do we have a poll for you that we can we can uh, do whenever is appropriate but uh, you know really just how how then given these key challenges, are we going to align, you know, the security stacks with business and technical requirements? Uh, yeah. what, what are your thoughts? So I think that, uh, you know, one, one, of, one of the challenges we see a lot is that, uh, you know, often we don't choose the tools that are right for us, right? We, we're going to alter our processes to the tools that we have. You, you, you know those kind of things? You know what I'm talking about? For sure. Yeah. yeah. So so I think that one of the thing one of the key things that uh, uh we try and uh you know consult to our customers is that uh they're trying to first understand your business risks. So try to disconnect from all the buzzwords, try to disconnect from all the salespeople that are uh, uh in your office and trying to you know save, save the day. Let's understand the business risks because when you align your security to the business risk, this is where you bring a lot of value. And we see a lot of the time uh, we encounter uh, uh, companies that come for, to help us. And uh, you know, you hear a lot of "I want a lot of uh, detection rules." Like I want uh, they care about the number; they, they don't really care about you know the content. And, but, yeah. Yeah. And and, and then. You know, a lot of the time you see those often you see those customers uh, uh, down the line suffer from those uh, uh, you know uh, advisories and, and and attacks and things like that because they are they put the business risk 
and uh, sorry, the business uh, logic uh, below, right? So this is why we recommend understand your business logic, understand the business uh, risk that you have, and then choose the right tools that can help you protect those kind of things. Right? So if I'm, for example, I, I have a, I'm a manufacturer and I have a lot of IoT, right? So it doesn't really matter if I'm, uh, I'm you know, investing a lot in, I don't know, in, in protecting IT or doing a lot in uh, protecting, uh, you know, the cloud. In the end, my business risk is the IoT. And, and this is, you know, kind of things that we see a lot. Yeah, I think I think kind of just restating what you said in, in, in my own words, it, it would be people are often trying to adapt their business to the technology rather than use the technology, make the technology adapt to the business. Right. I mean, that's what you saw. I'm just using my own my own words. But yeah, that's that's clearly clearly a, a challenge over overall. And I think one of the, the, the very arguably overused adages in in the cybersecurity industry is this thing called people processes and technology right that's a that's a triad uh you know you need all three and as sagi as, as you like to point out what's the first one of people yeah. process? people process and only oh, then the process and technology and there's a reason for that order right the people need to come first not the technology and you know, you know, in previous SOC master classes, we've talked about that. But really, I, I I don't know what your your opinion is, but but mine is universally that people are far more important than than, than technology, uh, and that it's not a stool of equal th uh, legs. You know, if you if you're kind of trying to create a mental light, a mental picture of, of a three legged stool, the people would be a very big leg uh, to 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 properly prop it up, right, and and very reinforced. Yeah, and, and we see it and we see it a lot that uh, in the end, no matter how sophisticated your uh, security tools and things like that, often you know the first entry is from a human. One of, one of the things that just you know in my you know near thirty years of doing this, you know I've I've, I've talked to so many different clients, and I'm, I'm I'm sure I'm curious if you've also observed this. It's like I talked to different clients, and they got you know. Great vendor X, you know, that's the hot topic. You talk to one client, it's it, it doesn't work. It's a it's it's garbage. You talk to another client, it's the best thing since sliced bread. It does everything the business does. What, what does that tell me over the over the decades? It tells me, silly. It's not the tool. It's the people running the tool, uh, yeah. for, for sure. And so, as as I think about as I think about that. You know what? You know we talked about you know why, but kind of now how do you do that? How how do you do this, right? How do you start to streamline your your, your technology adoption? And now we we made it very clear statement that you know people first, business first, make the technology adapt to the people in the business, not the other way around. You know everyone has to go through you know a classical build versus buy in 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 technology. Some people have very unique requirement sets, and they might. They might build their technology. If we take, you know, a topic like a a security analytics platform, sometimes referred to as a a, a SIM or SIEM, depending on where you are in the world, a, a security uh, information event management platform, you know, you, you might build your own, or you, you know, you might be an MSSP and you build a proprietary platform, or uh, you might say, hey, you know, the likes of these very, very large, very, very large companies like uh, Google and 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 Microsoft, you know, they they build these sorts of tools, and you can buy commercial off the shelf from them, and uh, you have to go through that rationalization, right? So, which do you have the resources to develop all this? Does the roadmap make sense? All that sort of thing, uh, you, you know. And so that's that's an important thing, but also uh, in relation to that. Is once you've you, you've thought about you know are you going to build a, an analytics platform, or are you going to buy a, an analytics platform in relation to cybersecurity? Right, we're talking about moving to the cloud. You're obviously going to not use your on-premises technologies, and you you need an analytics platform. So you're going to go through that build versus buy, uh, and then ultimately you're going to have to put the analytics in it. So it's kind of this. I, I think the how is kind of a two-step process. First, you need to decide whether you're going to build or buy, and you're going to go through that rationalization. And uh, you know, a number of these these technologies are uh, you know use open source solutions under the hood like Logstash, 
and, and that sort of thing to to get the logs into the system and this sort of thing. Uh, but once you got the once you've gone through this this engineering effort, and I, and I, I got to point out a lot of times people go through this Herculean effort, and it is Herculean to get all the data into the system, and they're so exhausted they they forget to think about their detection because they're like, oh, I got all my I got everything in into the into the analytics platform. Well, great. You know, having all your data in the system is one thing, but if you're not detecting any threats, you, you, you've missed the, the what you need to do in the first place and how you're going to do it. So once you've gone through that, uh, getting the data in the system and you're writing the analytics rules, you, you know, you really also have to think, you know, many companies have been operating for decades and they have invested, you know, decades of, of detection logic of their businesses in their analytics platform. And that, that investment, you know, I've talked to just in my like my previous example, I've talked to a variety of clients who will say, uh, you know, I need to migrate those rules. You know, we've taken decades to do, and it might be moving from one platform to another that uses another language, and and that has to all be translated similarly and tested. And uh, you know, I think so. You could talk ad nauseum more time than we have about the pains and the uh, of that that. That, but another another approach might be, you know, garbage in and garbage out. Maybe what you invested in was 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 not decades of, of of detection rules, or you don't feel the quality of your your detection logic in your existing platform as you move to the move to the cloud is is sufficient. In that case, you know, you, you might want to choose a a, a a threat model and an approach and just make it all new in the cloud. You know, why, why Mike? Because if you're going to migrate garbage. Uh, from one to the other, you're going to end up with just like we talked about earlier with uh, migrating uh, lifted shift. That's not a good approach. So don't take your on-premise stuff and just jam it into the cloud. It, it, it will deliver poor results. So, you know, what are you thinking of um, in terms of of that that roadmap for for, for migration? Yeah. So, that's so so you're absolutely right about uh, you know the example with the theme, right, and, and the the content. So one of the things that uh, we often see as a challenge to a lot of organization when they migrate is that we are not comparing apples to apples, right? So as we said in the beginning, so when we go to the cloud, we are changing the way we are thinking from, you know, the traditional, I have a server, I have an OS, I'm going to install it, whatever I want, right? We are changing to, as you said, to cloud native solution. So this is not apple to apple. So I cannot take a detection rule that works on the on-prem and then take it as is and put it on the cloud. This is why, a lot of the time we recommend, you know, the, the, our customers is that instead of looking, taking one-to-one, -one, what we want to look about is we want to look about the coverage. What coverage does do we get from this specific detection rule? And we want to replicate the coverage and not the rule, right? Make sense? And, and, and as you said, one of the things that are, uh, happen when when a lot of organization migrate to the cloud is that uh, there is a lot of pressure of doing everything and we do everything uh you do it uh you know under pressure uh it's feel like this that uh, in the end you like you are uh, you're breathless you mm -hmm. you're tireless and then it's really hard for you to go in and focus on those kind of things so one of the things that we did we build some kind of a framework that uh, this is how we can support our customers. And what we are doing is that we talked before about streamlining, streamlining the you know the the technology stack. So we are migrating to the cloud. So probably we are going to change few of our uh, technology stacks. So what we would want to do is we want to assess the existing security stack. We want to understand, for example, the licensing. So where we have more space, where we have less space in terms of timing. To the migration because a lot of the time when we do migration to the cloud our customer can say hey i have today um uh theme a and the license is until uh, i don't know end of the year so now it means that we need to finish the migration until the end of the year right so sometimes we have more time sometimes we have less time and this is where we're trying to understand all the licensing and all the time uh, time frames that we have then based on the priority and, and of course the business risk, we will decide where we start and how we do it. And we slowly phase out and we slowly do the migration, right? And this is how we uh, work together with the customer and we build this uh, roadmap for him and we guide him and support him in his migration process. Yeah, I, I thought I'd call out, you brought to mind a couple of concrete examples, right? I mean, one is, 
you know, you talked earlier about SaaS versus, you know, PaaS serverless and, and, and IaaS, you know, this infrastructure as a service. So as I, you know, things like, uh, you know, AWS Lambdas or Azure Functions, these don't have corollaries that you could have migrated from an on-premise because they didn't, they don't exist. They have different approaches. So you also, that this is where something like, you know, when I talked about earlier, the, the CSA, the Cloud Security Alliance, uh, you know, Cloud Controls Matrix, right, can, can, can help with that sort of thing. Um, but I think the other thing is, you know, shadow IT, this, this concept of SaaS, uh, I think that whether you recognize it or not, every company has uh, people with expense accounts and they're going to solve their business problems. And if IT is not solving it and security is not is being a roadblock to the business, what people are going to do is they're going to take out their credit card and they're just going to buy something <laughs> in the cloud. And, uh, you know, so I think that. But it's important to be be supportive of that as uh, so that you can detect it right because again people and processes and all that you you build out this this roadmap but if you're you're building a culture within your company uh that's that's not conducive to the business you're gonna have, you're, you're gonna fail so again people and processes uh that, that support doing that is is so critical often if you find yourself chasing about uh, after employees that using the credit card to you know uh, buy services that uh, let them do the work or you're doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, let's, uh, let's maybe uh, launch um, a couple of poll questions. Um, let's get some uh, feedback from, from the audience. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll read through it. We actually got a couple here. Um, first one, in your organization, what has been the most painful cloud security challenge? Uh, if you had to choose one, what would it be? So um, that's the first question. There's a few few options in there, and the second one is: What is the primary cybersecurity challenge faced by your organization in your on-prem or cloud configurations? Okay. So take a take a, a minute to uh, to answer them if you if you would, and then we'll we'll display the answers and get some feedback and. Uh, Reaction from Sunday and Jason. Okay. One more moment. Okay. If anyone else want to answer the question, still a few people still adding their answers. Okay. We're going to stop it now. Last, last. Last few seconds, wow, gosh, suddenly loads of people are waking up. They've had their extra caffeine. Okay, I'm going to stop it now. All right, so let's let's just take a look at the first uh, first question for now. Jason, what's uh, what do we see here? We, we're seeing <laughs> um, a, a very a broad range, right? So, you know, basically 20% 20, 20 for data security, compliance configuration, and uh, and lack of visibility as well, and then a smaller, smaller percentage, eight percent for identity management and um, translating on-premise security models to cloud. Uh, small. Any any thoughts on that? What what? How would you have answered this? I I will I will divide it to two. So what most painful compliance? <laughs> 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 what most challenging? I think that uh, it's it's around the configuration uh of, of those kind of things so this is like uh my take on it I, yeah for sure and just to kind of riff off of what sagi was saying it, it depends on your view of compliance right the, the culture of some companies or many companies and compliance is you know i just need to check a box and and move on so they, they check all the boxes the auditors come in, they pass, and then, you know, immediately, the you know, or they have findings and they got to address them. And it's this this activity that happens all the, all the time. So it, it gets very frustrating. So, you know, that's where it's so important to have a, a CISO and, and leadership team who can align compliance uh, with actual security outcomes that you want to achieve in your, your, your culture, not just be check the box, right? These things generally have a real reason to do them, not, not just do them to do because they need to be done. Um, I think that's so important, kind of understanding the why that they need to be done. And unfortunately, that's not often the case. But I am a little bit surprised by the identity management being so low. I mean, um, I can think of, unless people were thinking of identity management as a subset of configuration, because from my perspective, um, 
identity management is, is, is so crucial, not just from, from a configuration perspective, uh, excuse me, not just so much from, you know, an, an RBAC perspective, but all of the, all of the things that go on with, with, with it, you know, SSO, SAML, you know, all these sorts of uh, OAuth tokens, all these sorts of things, because, you know, maybe we'll, you know, we could talk at another time a little bit about what is what is cloud native and all that. But if microservices are part of it, you've got this prolific use of, of a, APIs and how that all goes through. So um, I think identity management, I feel like it's underrepresented in, in the poll. Okay. And uh, the second one is, is like, it's uh, on, on reflection, maybe it's, it's sort of a similar, similar question, but, you know, what, what would the, uh, the, the primary, you know, Challenges faced uh, by your organization and here, definitely a couple. Uh, well, all the above, right? Compliance, data exposure, misconfiguration, difficulty to monitor and, and detect threats. So, um, I think you know the, the winner there is that all. Um, if, you other, add, if you add even more challenges, <laughs> it will still be all of the above. <laughs> Yeah. So as as you think about yeah, as I think about it, the, the challenge really is all of these frameworks, whether they're you know, controls frameworks or laws or what have you, policies, etc. The, the the challenge becomes the vast majority of them have speak nothing to prioritization, and so it really requires you know strong data analytics and leadership to understand really the nuances and 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 prioritize because. The pace and the sophistication that are coming at us as, as security and technology experts is just in, it's, it's nearly immeasurable. And as such, it's like, well, all right, is it just going to become tyranny of the urgent? Is just, am I going to just deal with whatever barks at me the loudest? Because that's not a good strategy. <laughs> and really, uh, you need to have an, a you know a strong leadership and an approach to how you're prioritizing these things. So I, as I looked at the poll, most of them look relatively equal. And I kind of echo what Sagi said that, you know, what, no matter how long the list is, it's all of the above. <laughs> so I, I want to move to a different topic and also um, give enough time for maybe one or two, uh, two questions from, uh, from the audience. So um, one, one of the big, big issues that, that we certainly keep hearing, and, and I'd like to get both of your view on this is, you know, the, the challenge of, you know, cost, associated with uh, storage um, in, in the cloud. And um, you know, I know both of you have been very involved in um, being able to kind of evaluate you know, how applications um, you know, are, are being optimized and in specific um, around this concept of a security data lake. Um, so maybe Sagi, if you could start, first of all, maybe just give us a, you know, a 101 on what is actually a, a data lake. and um, you know, how, how can you evaluate, um, you know, the effectiveness and the, what, what kind of, you know, what, what is, what's its role and how does that help security operations teams? Yeah, so uh, I'm happy that you asked it, Howard. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think that one of the things that uh, uh, we see a lot, and I think that in fact, if we kind of um, build a lot around it, so, just as you said, so one of the things that I and said it uh, multiple times that we are in the era of data. So we are moving to the cloud. We have more and more services. We have on prem. Uh, we have so much data, and this data is crucial and it's important. And one of the things that we saw is that while this is most of the data is very very important for us for compliance, for reporting, for threat hunting, for things like that. So one of the things that we we see is that storing all these logs is very, very expensive. Because when we go to uh, our, uh, all the same platform, cloud native and not cloud native, usually the, the licensing model will be based on uh, data, amount of data that you ingest, right? So one of the things that we did uh, here in Cyproof is that we adopted a data lake approach where we store all the information. So all the data that comes into uh, from any uh, every log source will go to one data lake. When we have all the information inside one data lake and it's a cheap data lake, it gives us the ability to do so much for the organization. 
Now, before I go there, so, okay, we put all the data inside the data lake. So what about my theme, right? So what we will do is, again, is something that we developed in, in Sarkook is that we will take all the events that are relevant for detection rule and we will put them inside the theme. But the rest of them will go to the data lake. And this will provide us a very, very uh, strong hybrid model and that allow us to reduce the cost by 60, 70% of the TCO of others. And, and the beauty of it is that it's open so many possibilities for the security group, because as we know, and one of the biggest challenges that uh, every CISO has is that the security team often uh, uh, you know, spend money and doesn't generate money. So a lot of the time we need to justify why I need this money and why I need this budget. And by leveraging data like, like this, give us the ability to start selling it inside the organization. So now we saw it a lot in, in our customers. Now the data like that they have is very good to do AI and machine learning. And it's very good to start to, to detect frauds in other platforms. It's give them a lot of uh, information and their business applications. So now they have a very powerful data lake that can, you know, give them more value inside the organization and then generate more revenue around it. And this is a very important topic. Yeah, so, so Sagi, if I were to take a, a, let's say a debatable, there's some controversy in our industry about that and, and give a, a specific topic, uh, you often are known for saying, you know, uh, ingest more and pay less, right? So one of the challenges often with with these security architectures and analytics platforms is how much data do I put in, right? And if I were to take another concrete example, uh, maybe you have a, a you know a endpoint protection or uh, endpoint detection response platform. Every time a server or a workstation launches a process, that could create a log. And anyone that knows much about computers knows that they're constantly launching processes. So that creates an enormous amount of information and, and logs. And so there's a little bit of controversy around, what, you know, should you really put every one of those logs in the sim? Is that necessary or not? Maybe I should use a data fabric rather than a data lake. Um, what, are, what are some of, the, what are your, some of thought, thoughts about, about that? Like, is, it, is the data lake a, a solution to all? Should you literally just put everything in there because it's limitless and, and near free? Or what are your thoughts? So a lot of the time I hear, especially in the beginning of uh, you know, the journey to cloud native uh, solutions and, and the challenges of the cost, I hear a lot, even from vendors. So you need to optimize your collection. And by mean optimize the collection, you need to remove events that you, you don't need or they're less priority, right? And I think this is crazy because we need the visibility because maybe there is a, uh, we cover, we have detection rules and we cover everything that we know. But uh, there is a say in the uh, Air Force uh, Navy in Israel, like they say, they say, the one that you cannot see is the one that take you down, right? And, and when you don't collect the logs, when you don't do those kind of things, when there is zero days, but there are new threats, you are not aware. So yes, you can then uh, reactive. So yes, there is a new thread like log4j. Now let's start collecting those kind of logs. But you're you're completely blind on what happens until the day that you heard about it. And by getting all those logs into Data Lake, right? And because of uh, the cost optimization, it's it's like very cheap. So if something like log4j rise, for you just hunting query, you run an hunting query, and you look all the way back, and you know exactly the moment that has been leveraged or if it was leveraged in your organization, right? And this is why, if you ask me, we need to see everything. We need everything. But, but you know, this is, this is the challenge of understanding what goes to the sim and what goes to the data lake. For sure. Let's just take one more, one more question um, that, that came in uh, through, through the Q&A. Um, it, it is a big topic, but let's maybe keep it at a high level. So question came in about, you know, how, how can we upskill to store our platform writing playbooks and automation? And how's that going to, how's that, assuming you've done that upskilling, how's that going to impact 
the analysts' roles and responsibilities? Maybe, Jason, can you uh, take a crack at that? Yeah, you know, I, I have a pretty strong strong opinion on this. That, that you know, to, to upskill people, it's really about you know not your, uh, your 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 attitude far more than your your aptitude, right? I mean, there are so many free learning and things out there. There is no lack of training uh, available. We just need more people to do this, right? So, I, I think in in many cases. Uh, employers need to think about how how they can provide that time because employer obviously many for profit companies are so focused on profit that that they need to focus on all their energies on those activities without without allowing their resources the the time to to upskill and train but specifically all, all the major providers you know whether that's AWS uh, Google uh, Microsoft or whatnot they all have tremendously good learning platforms, cert certifications that you could upskill with. And so really it's a, it's a function of giving your people the time to do that and, and some prescription. And that's something that I think, you know, leadership really needs to take ownership and accountability of. I don't know that I can cover that in a, in a few little pithy statements here, but really taking ownership of being prescriptive about the training, understanding the roadmap as Sagi was talking about earlier, and then being prescriptive to your resources on what they need to learn. You know, there's like Sagi gave the example of different access controls in Azure Data Explorer uh, versus, say, log analytics. Well, some of the workers don't even know they're going to be working in those environments. So it's incumbent upon the, the, the leadership team to have a high level understanding of what those are and be prescriptive about the training so that those those people can know and they can get upskilled. You know, I'm I, I think there's just a tremendous amount of learning opportunities and platforms out there that are that are free. Start there, and you get an incredible mileage. I mean, just just to answer the the second part of how it's going to impact uh, this whole learning responsibility. So I think that uh, SOAR is, is is crucial, and I think that uh, uh, the more automations that we have, uh, the more integrations that we have, uh, the easiest is for it will be for us to not only detect and but respond. And I think that. Uh, uh, a strong security operation has to invest a lot uh, in automations, uh, specifically in SOAR when we talk about security. So I think that uh, um, as the time will move on, you know, more, the focus will be more and more and more about those automations. So I think that's it's crucial. Mm -hmm. Well, we could go on for a lot longer, and I know that we had uh, prepared a uh quite a bit of material, we definitely have to uh, leverage it for another occasion, but um, Sagi and Jason, really many thanks for, for joining us today. And um, we will uh, wrap up this session. And uh, I think we, we're really time to uh, to go straight over to, to the next session. So uh, thank you again. And uh, for the audience, uh, you know, please, please stay with us. And uh, we will start our next session um, in the next uh, round, as soon as we have everybody uh, everybody with us. So thank, thank you. you very much for having us. You're welcome.